So hello, Swami. Or Steve. Whoa, I, wait, actually, Swami? I don't know. Is it Swami or Steve that I'm interviewing yeah, today? I am then the Swami persona right now. Uh, and uh, Steve is channeling me. And then later, I will channel him. Oh, fantastic. Okay. fantastic. So I'm a multiple personality. <laughs> There's many of us in here. And, you know, that's very, very efficient because I, I read about somebody who had 10 personalities. And I went, wow, now that is efficiency. If we had more people like that, we'd need fewer people. Yeah, that's right. So right now you're actually a, a guru and a comedian or a comedian and a guru? Well, you know what? I think that there's probably both. Because first of all, we take the word guru and we turn it around and we spell it out for people. We go G-U-R-U. <laughs> <laughs> that is the great teaching. Because each of us is totally unique just like everybody else. So. G-U-R-U, your experiences are like nobody else's experience. Yeah. Okay. So that is the teaching. And then laughter, well, laughter is really what makes the world go round. Yeah. Because let's face it, we are living in very, very serious times. And the reason why we are in such serious condition is because of our conditioning to be serious. Seriously. Okay. Seriously, Seriously. So, we've, we, so we've missed the big joke. That's what you're telling us. We should. We miss. We miss the. the there's something funny that we've missed. There's a yes, big joke uh, here. The big joke. And somebody said, Swami, how do you explain the suffering of all the people on the planet who don't have enough to eat? And I said, you know what? That is easy to explain. What is harder to explain is all the suffering on the planet of the people who have plenty to eat. Because so much of our suffering is self-imposed. You know, look at the lilies of the valley, right? The lilies of the valley, toilet, not. Nor do they drive BMWs, okay? <laughs> but the point is this, that we really have all that we need to be happy. And we forget. We think that somebody is, might be more happier than we are. And what uh, Sigmund Freud called this uh, uh, happiness envy. Okay, so the idea is that we, if we want to be happy, we bring it from the inside out. We take it with us everywhere we, we can. And happiness is not a condition that's outside. It's an internal condition. Mm -hmm. So if we think that something out there is going to make us happy, then we are going to keep that out there away from our reach. Because if we reach that, then where would we be? We'd be happy. But we could be happy without it, you see? Uh -huh. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So, so you um, you do you, so you teach people how to laugh more, or you you're actually practicing uh, cosmic laughter. Tell us well, about that one. So well, you're bringing um, the love of the universe out on the planet. Well, I think that love comes through happiness, and happiness is sometimes related to laughter. Okay. Now, sometimes we uh, we have the average child laughs about 150 times a day. The average adult only laughs about 15 times a day. So do the math. Do the aftermath. And the aftermath is that we are not as joyful as we could be. If we came to life with more joy, then more joy would show up to reflect that. Yes? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I am, so what, what the teachings are is to help people what I, do what I call self facing humor. That is to be able to laugh at ourselves. Because I, I, as a, I, I have a non-religion that I practice called fundamentalism with the accent on the fun. Mm -hmm. And we believe that life is a joke, but the creator is laughing with us, not at us. And we are given free choice in life. We get to decide whether or not we laugh. Mm -hmm. So if you want to be miserable, go right ahead, whatever makes you happy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you even became a politician, haven't you? You have created a party. I, I call it the, the right to laugh party because <laughs> our uh, seriousness has been threatening our right to laugh. And the idea of this party, unlike the two political, dysfunctional political parties we have in America right now, <laughs> who spend all of their energy arguing about whether it's worse to kill the born or the unborn, yes, we have the right to laugh party. Our slogan is one big party, everybody is invited. And all we ask is for people to take a vow of levity. Levity, uh, not gravity or not... Uh, oh, gravity brings you down, levity lifts you up. 
Okay? Got it. And when we talk about the gravitational pull, that's this. <laughs> gravitational pull is this. It pulls the corners of the mouth upward in a smile. Now, what's interesting is that we say, well, what if I have nothing to laugh at, nothing to smile at? If you smile for no reason and you do this, Mm-hmm. It sends signals to the body to produce more happiness hormones. So we don't smile necessarily because we're happy. We are happy because we smile. So it's interesting. The body thinks that we're happy, and so it actually creates the chemistry to make us happy. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Isn't that funny? Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's the other way that most people actually function in life. Yeah. So if you, so I, have a, I, I know this person. Who, had a, who, who lost a whole bunch of money on one day, and he was not happy. Wow. And he went into the men's room, and he caught a glimpse of himself in the mirror, and he looked at this sour face he had. And just as a joke, because he was feeling so bad, he put his face in the mirror, and he went, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> and he did that until he actually began to laugh. And then after that, all of the emotional energy emotion energy in motion Mm -hmm. it took the emotional energy from the upset and channeled that energy into laughter and at the end he felt better and that was many years ago and he's become very successful since then he has never looked back at that situation as a negative situation he healed it through the power of bringing love and laughter to it he did this practice he he didn't even know he was doing that but that's what happened about that healing power then of laughter can you is that part of swami's uh mission absolutely this is my vision now i'll tell you a true story norman cousins he was a writer maybe about 40 years ago he was diagnosed with a life-threatening illness he checked into a hotel room with marx brothers movies and candid camera reruns and he cured himself and when he cured himself The medical establishment decided that they are going to study the healing power of laughter. And that's kind of like, well, it works in practice, but does it work in theory? And sure enough, they found that when we laugh, it creates these hormones called endorphins, which are our body's natural painkillers. Laughing improves immune function. Laughter lowers the blood pressure. Because when we laugh, it causes our blood vessels to dilate, and that is better than having them die early. Mm -hmm. I want mine to dilate. And so we know that laughter is good for us. And even for no reason, if you laugh for no reason, just like my friend who had this uh, this thing, serious thing happened to him, he laughed for no reason and he was able to release that emotional tension. Mm, But sometimes it's hard when we're caught up in the seriousness of life to actually break and and find uh, something to laugh about. So what's the process? Do you have a technique to... Well, yes. I mean, first of all, la- you know, there's a certain time when it is very appropriate to feel sadness, yes? Yeah. And so we don't want to preempt that. We don't want to say don't feel sad because that is part of life as well. Mm-hmm. But sometimes suffering no longer serves a purpose. And we find that we seem to be going around and around and around on the same things. And so the first thing that you can do, and this is once you've decided that, you know, maybe if I laughed at this, things would change. You look in the mirror, and if, uh, if if you have a sour expression on your face, that's something to laugh at right there, yes? And you begin to laugh, you begin to laugh with yourself. Sometimes you want to create a funny voice, Mm -hmm. like Twinkle, and tell your people your problems like this, I lost my job and I have no money. (laughs) And if you're looking in the mirror while you do this, you will begin to see the natural humor of life. But you don't want to do this until you're ready to laugh. Because I think that there's, we don't want to go to, I feel good on top of something that doesn't feel good. You want to honor all of your feelings, but there comes a time when you go, you know what, maybe I need the perspective of laughter. Because if nothing else, physically, your body will think you're good and it'll produce these hormones. That will make you feel even better. And that's a signal you're saying to the universe, and then it sends more to laugh about. Well, you know, this is, this is the, they talk about the law of attraction, yeah. which yeah. for many people is the law of repulsion, because <laughs> you want to think so much, you repel it. Yes? But most of the okay. time, that's what happens, yeah. Yes. 
But if you allow yourself to feel peaceful, more of that peacefulness will come. And it's a habit. It's a habit. And unfortunately, we've, we've so have gotten into the habit yeah. of being stuck in our stories, right? Yeah. Everybody has a story. And if it weren't for my story, who would I be? Yeah. And so we keep repeating these same stories over and over again. And uh, we sacrifice being happy for being right. Yeah. And this is called smarterdom. <laughs> yeah. Smart. Yes, yes, yes. I am happy. I'm very smart, but I'm unhappy. So we don't want to make that sacrifice. So allow yourself to, to be happy. Now, you know, in these times of great challenges, people are consulting the great mystics on the planet. Mm-hmm. So that's why we're happy to have you. Well, you know, there's two kinds of mystics, right? There are the optimistics and the pessimistics. <laughs> so the pessimistics are very much in touch with linear reality. But the optimistics are happier and live longer for some reason. Well, that's okay? good. So we're all mystics. That's a good news. Yes, yes. And, <laughs> and you know, the, the, the pessimistics are saying, oh, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. The optimistics are saying, no, it only looks that way because we're ascending. That's still very serious, though, you're, right? Well, no, no, no. It's not serious at all because we're ascending because of our levity. Levity is helping us rise. Helping us rise above whatever has been bringing us down. Now, when somebody, well, you, know, you know, actually happiness and love is like loaves and fishes. Because one person can walk into a room glowing with happiness And it can be actually contagious. Everybody can catch it from that person. Mm -hmm. And and all of a sudden, that happiness magnifies and people leave with it. And it multiplies without diminishing anybody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it raises natural the frequency of the room. Oh, yes. The frequency. Yes. Now, this is very, very interesting about frequency. You know, many years ago, I don't know if you heard about the Kinsey Report. Yeah. The Kinsey Report was, for those people who don't know, Uh, Back in the 1940s, there was a man, uh, Kinsey, who went around doing surveys about people's sexuality. And up to that point, it had never really been studied and made public. And um, and so he was he was actually measuring frequency because he he would ask people, how frequently do you have sex? (laughs) And he he sees this one guy who he's interviewing and this guy is in bliss. He is totally ecstatically happy. And he asked the man, how often do you have sex? And the man says, every, once every six years. And uh, Kinsey said, well, I'm, I'm surprised to hear that. Uh, why are you so happy? He says, tonight's the night. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So low frequencies can cause depression. So we want to raise our frequencies, yeah. Yeah. Wow, wow, wow. Um, um, let me see, let me see, let me see. Um, so how, how can we really create this heart-opening laughter? Because it's not just any kind of laughter. I guess there's different kinds because you're talking of the heart-opening one. Well, you know what? There's two, the two chakras that we want to open with the laughter is the heart chakra and the, the uh, belly chakra. Yes? The solar plexus, okay? Because okay. we let sunshine in through the solar plexus. So hearty laughter, hearty laughter is ha, 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 ha. Now, interestingly, in Qigong, the sound for the heart is ha. The sound that strengthens the heart is ha, yes? So here we have hearty laughter, ha, 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 ha. Down here in the belly, we have ho, 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 ho. So the belly laughter Brings in the sunshine, brings in the light. The hearty laughter, ha, 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 brings in the love. And then we have love and light through laughter. Uh So sometimes people forget to laugh. We call this irregular hilarity. (laughs) So we want to recommend a good laxative twice a day. Good laxative. Laxative, yes. And this will prevent truth decay and also prevent humoroids as well. Do you do you find sometimes some people that just don't get your humor? I mean, don't don't get that. I mean, do you actually annoy people? I don't intentionally annoy anybody, <laughs> and I don't actually do humor in front of people 
who um, who don't want to come. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I, you don't want to impose humor. You know that that's what they call strained humor. You don't want strained people. You want to invite people to come laugh, and if they come and laugh, then they are tickled and delighted. And if they don't come and laugh, that is their choice, free choice. Okay, that is why we have free, free will, choice. Free, yeah. free will. Okay, but if we do choose to laugh, then we find that our body chemistry changes for the better. Uh huh. Uh huh. So how if, we're not, if, if we found ourselves in a party though, and it's just like we're not having fun, and the vibration is pretty low, and we're just having. So how do we break that? How do we? How do we start having fun? Well, first of all, um, the question is: Do you want to really be at that party? Maybe there's something. <laughs> For you. Right. Not, not everybody shines at parties. Sometimes people are less, uh, are more shy, and that's why people use these substances to make them less inhibited. Yes, but uh, if you really want to, uh, if the first thing I would do at one of these parties is simply go right into the heart. Hmm? Just go right over here and breathe into the heart. And feel it, what they call the inner smile. And feel that smile mm. welling up from the inside until it turns the corners of your mouth like this. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, there's a lot of people on the planet who want to uplift humankind, but they're sourpusses like this. <laughs> so if you want to uplift humanity, begin with your own mouth like mm -hmm. that. So if you're, at, if you're peaceful, if you're at a party... And you, you create this inner peace, and there's other people who are attracted to that inner peace, then they will walk over to you like a magnet. But if you are if you are guarded, if you're not having fun, and if you're still not having fun after a while, then go home. Find mm -hmm. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. something else to do. Because I think that what happens in a party setting is that you know not everybody is extroverted. We do have people who who like to be with people one-on-one -on -one and get to know them better. So that kind of individual would be much better off in a smaller gathering, doing something that they love to do. And then that way, they will be so absorbed in what they love to do that they will forget to be self-conscious. And then other people can come and find out who they are. Mm. So how about in life? How do you create fun when there is no fun? How do you create fun when there is no fun? Well... I would say that the first step is to ask yourself, what do I love to do? What's fun for me? And uh, if you can't answer that question, then go back to kindergarten and try that. Mm -hmm. Imagine what we used to do when we were children, you know, the kinds of things that we did that used our imagination. Yes? Mm -hmm. So that's the first step is to, if, you, if you're not feeling that something is fun, then simply ask the question, What would I love? What would be fun? Now, some people are so far away from having that because they've spent so many years being immersed in seriousness that they have to, they may need remedial kindergarten. They may need remedial play classes so that they can remember what it was like to be in that space of curiosity, to be in that space of wonder and that space of not knowing See, we all want to know everything, but let's face it. In these times, what are we facing? We are facing the unknown. Mm -hmm. What better way to face the unknown than by not knowing? Mm. I don't know. I am prepared for the unknown. Like the Dalai Lama. The Dalai Lama is perfect that way. Because the Dalai Lama, he, I, I, I watched this, this video of him. He's being interview, interviewed by a very serious American Buddhist scholar. And for every other question, Dalai Lama's answer is, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Now, that is the yeah. So if you want to know what to do, watch the Dalai Lama. And, you know, I tell you something. I admire the Dalai Lama. I admire him very much. And so one of my visions, I call it television, where I television to you, you television to me. My television is that someday in the very near future, the Dalai Lama will be able to return and live in his homeland where he belongs. And when he gets off the plane, I want to be there to greet him and to sing to him, Hello, Dolly. Yes, hello, Dolly. It's so good to have you back where you belong. <laughs> Maybe yes, you should we, bring Steven. 
Okay. Well, then I will go behind the tree. And when I disappear, he will come back. Okay? Okay. Okay. Here we go.